Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. Fifty-one to fifty-two million visitors coming to New York City. Where do they stay? They stay at the hundred thousand hotel rooms in New York. Is a person responsible for helping these employees of the hotel workers? The person, his name is Peter Ward, who is the president of the New York Hotel Trades Council and the business manager of Local Six. And I'm fortunate to have Peter Ward today. So, Peter, tell me about your, your grandparents and then your, your parents. You said your, your grandparents weren't even immigrants. They, their generation. Tell me about them. My, uh, my grandfather on my father's side was a silversmith. In fact, he was known for designing the first silverware for the original Waldorf Astoria Hotel. That was his distinction, one of his professional distinctions. And as I understand it, he died at a rather young age um, uh, from industrial exposure to the chemicals that they used uh, in producing fine silver. And so my father was raised by his mother and rather large extended family of siblings. He was the second youngest of 12 and uh, grew up in, in Brooklyn, right near the Brooklyn Navy Yard on the Delphi Street. Now, you, your father met his first wife because, you, um, where? Well, I don't know the story exactly, but my father was married twice. And, uh, and so his, his, his first wife is not my mother. But she passed on. She did. My father was married almost 14 years to the day to his first wife, and she died of kidney disease, and he had two children with her. Your oldest? My older sister, who's the oldest of the whole gang and my my brother Gary who's uh, they're both in their 70s now right and then your your father met your your mother that's right and how did he meet her he was introduced by a mutual friend right now at this time your father was doing what what was his business at that time he was a sales executive um, for a company called intermaritime freight forwarders and what they did basically was provide a service of clearing goods um, imported goods through customs um, quickly. So they were brokers, they were customs brokers. Now you said your, your older sister and older brother were living up in Geneva, New York or something like that? At the time of my, my dad's first wife passing, um, I guess he was young and starting to find his way in, 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 in his career, and, I, and so an aunt um, took them up to Geneva where she was living and they went to high school up there. Now you're born and you told me it was, uh, now you're a twin. I am. 
And uh, you were born when? 1957. And then a couple months later, your other brother was born, right? No. My brother Kevin was born in January of 1957. Right. And then you? Now, Paul and I were born in December 1957. Right. So you said to me it was the Irish triplets, as you would say. That's right. And the, and the Irish triplets lived in the Marine Park section of Brooklyn, right? That's right. And we were in the same grade. Oh, that's right. You were all the, all, all the same grade. And when you were growing up, uh, y your dad was involved with the immigration, the freight forwarding business. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had a variety of odd jobs. What did you do? Oh, God, you know, a anything to make a buck. Paper route, worked in supermarkets, those kinds of things. Right. And you went to New York City public schools? I did. And then you graduated high school, and, and you really have no idea what you want to do, right? Yeah, that's true. So how, how do you end up at, at the lowest level job for a union? How, how do you even end up at a union? You know, it's funny how life is. So a friend recommended me for a job, and I got this job in the dues checkoff department of the union. Now, now wait, you, kids from Brooklyn, you know, we never saw hotels. I mean, I, I, I was never, were you ever at any of these hotels when you were growing up? I mean... Not before I went to work for the union. Right. I never was in a hotel. I mean, you know, I lived in Brooklyn. It was a different case. You didn't know anything. And you go to work for the union at the present headquarters, which is still there. On, That's correct. On 8th Avenue between 45th and 46th Street. Mm -hmm. And you get this job as a, as a, a dues checkoff? What's that? We're essentially verifying that members are paying dues. So what happens next? Well, it's an interesting time for the union. Uh, my union at the time was the Hotel Restaurant Employees Union. And the hotel portion of that union was Local 6, which was part of the Hotel Trades Council, was this fairly large, stable union that existed um, and prospered since the, since the 30s. Um, there were other unions affiliated with the same international union in New York that represented people in kosher delis, people in bars, restaurants, catering halls, things like that. And those three unions were falling on hard times. And the international, our international union, asked the leader of our union to allow for a merger of those unions with the idea that he would take control of them and help to straighten them out. Help them straighten them out from a practical point of view, but also to straighten them out financially and get them onto some kind of a sound footing. So that happened shortly after I arrived at the union. And what happens now? You, so from, from dues check of guy, what, do you, what happens? Well, it's a chaotic time, as I said. And the leader of the union was a rather charismatic guy by the name of Vito Pitta. And uh, I guess he's trying to figure out how to fix the thousands of problems that he's encountering. And um, there's a decertification election for, what, what, you know, for my audience, what does a decertification mean? The workers in the downstate medical center cafeteria decide that they want to get rid of the union. It was one of these unions that we had just merged with. We were probably merged a month or two. And they decided they wanted to get rid of the union, and they petitioned for an election to the National Labor Relations Board. And so uh, the boss asked me to tag along. Who is he? He wants, the, he wants the Irish mutt over there who's like 21, <laughs> right? He, wa he wants you to, to tag along because you knew Brooklyn. I know how to get to downstate by subway. Okay, so you got down at down the subway. What happens? So, he, so I, I, I go down with a group of people that, that were working in this union that merged with us, and I walk into my first industrial kitchen. And it's an eye-opener for me. It's an eye-opener because I'm seeing how people actually work in an industrial kitchen. And it's not your mom's kitchen. This is an industrial <laughs> environment. Um, and people are angry. They're angry at, this, at, this, at these uh, guys that are representing them from the union. They're angry at the way they're treated. They're angry with their union contract. They don't want to talk about why they should stay with our union. And so over the course of a day or two, I fortunately made contact with a couple of folks. I didn't know a lot, but I knew enough to say, this guy Vito Pitta is a really good guy, and he's just taken over the union, and he wants to make changes. And I think you ought to meet with him. And you go to a diner? So 
I get a couple of people to agree to this. I get him on the phone, and um, he says, set the meeting up. And we go and meet at the Fawesome Diner on, Rock in, on Rockaway uh, Boulevard in, um, in Brooklyn. And he meets with a group of these folks. And they're mostly women. Uh, there was a couple of guys. It was a group of about eight people. And um, he was smart. He was charismatic. He was charming. And he knew how to deal with people. And I sat there and watched him talk to these workers and listened to them. I think the most important thing that he did was he listened to them. And you could say that he was genuinely upset and angry at the way that they were being treated and the fact that they weren't being represented properly. And he made a commitment to them. He said, you don't know me, but if you trust me and you allow us to, not only will we represent you well, but I will personally negotiate the next contract. And, um, and so all those things happened. They trusted him. They voted the union back in. He negotiated the contract. And the contract he negotiated back then was really a significant contract. It was a three-year contract. I remember the wage increases were $25 a week in each year of the contract. For employees that were working in hospital cafeterias back in the 70s, that was a lot of money. No question. He improved their health care and got holidays and sick days and improved their vacation time. All in all, it was a remarkable achievement, and I got to be involved in it. And so for me, it was an eye-opening experience, and it was the beginning of a career at the union. So then what happened next? Well, I went back to do his checkoff. <laughs> and then? And then you got involved with organizing. I right? did. I did. And, uh, and so there was... The notion was that let's not just fix this union, but let's try to organize a little bit. Now, but you, like you said to me, for about seven years, you were not really involved with Local 6. You were involved with these other unions. Well, yeah, it was a shorter period of time than that, though. It was, it was a couple of years, a few years. And so uh, the next, the next um, big assignment that I worked on was uh, another decertification. And, um, and so... Tavern on the Green, who was represented by one of these restaurants. And the workers there were extremely unhappy. And it was very much a repeat of what had happened In Downstate. at Downstate, except that it was a, a different workforce. You had this dining room of young, um, very good-looking waiters and waitresses, many of whom were aspiring actors and actresses. Always in that industry, right. And you had, um, you know, a, uh, this... this, this um, fine dining restaurant with, a, with a, a, a real executive chef that was producing fine food and, and all of the layers of employees that are necessary to make that happen. And the one common thread seemed to be that they were all unhappy with the way, with, with the way they were treated at work and they were all very unhappy with the way they were being represented by the union. And so, again, we were able to talk to these workers and, and, and basically convinced them that there was, the union was turning a new page, that there was a new leader, that we were going to try to fix the problems that they had. And um, we negotiated a contract in Tavern on the Green that, again, represented a seismic shift in the way that they were treated. It not only changed the structure of the contract in terms of wages and benefits, but it also encompassed new language that... Um, balance the power dynamic uh, so that workers were actually, so that management was actually compelled to treat workers more fairly. Then later on, what happened with the, the, the Rainbow Room? Well, um, a, a couple of years into this whole thing, these unions became stable, um, and uh, another union was created called Local 100, and they demerged with our union uh, on, on the theory that hotel workers were better represented in one union and restaurant and in-plant feeding workers in another. And so they took Tavern on the Green with them. They took all the restaurants and created this new union. And, Tav and Rainbow Room closed for renovations. And it was closed for, I would guess, a couple of years. And it reopened under, under new management. They did not do business with the union. They 
told the union they wanted nothing to do with them. And, um, and so those workers came to us. And, uh, and we had an organizing drive that ended in a, a national labor relations election. And the restaurant was closed for 10 weeks, right? Well, <coughs> we were unable to negotiate a contract. The ownership was recalcitrant, and uh, we were unable to get to a deal. So we had a 10-week strike. And subsequently, well, you negotiated. The contract ended, the, the contract dispute ended was a very, very good contract. It was a contract at that point in time that I could say to you with, without equivocation was by far, not even by a small margin, the best restaurant contract in the United States of America. So what happens later? You, you go through the variety of jobs, you become a business. What happens in, so it's 1998 now? Mm -hmm. <coughs> 1998, which is 15 years ago. You're what, 40 years of age at this time? No, 49. No, no. I'm, I'm sorry, 39. 39, and you become the president. Yeah. And the business manager of the union. Something that people don't realize uh, that the, the union had done, and this really happened back in 1948, when Donald Rubin's father had done it. The, the union was one of the first unions to implement health insurance for their employees, correct? Well, I think we were one of the first unions to implement health insurance for workers at that at, of at, the, at um, the level, right, of, 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 of the, the lower the, level bus boys. It was or, unheard of that people working in restaurants and hotels would have medical coverage back then. One of the major accomplishments of you and the Hotel Trades Council and everything is the fact that health insurance that is provided by the union is approximately 40% lower than the cost of health insurance that people pay in the city of New York today. Mm -hmm. My predecessor's predecessor, there's only been three leaders of our union since it's his, in its entire history, right. was a guy by the name of Jay Rubin who was an, an immigrant from Poland. In fact, I'm the only leader of the union that was, was born, born in the here. U.S. And he was a brilliant guy. And um, he got the New York State Legislature to pass a law that allowed for medical facilities to be owned by entities other than doctors. And in negotiations with the hotel industry, got the industry to agree to fund a medical center. Um, and so that medical center ultimately became several medical centers, and the services began to expand as the union began to gain some power and influence over the industry. Originally, I think the idea was that we would have a medical center because we had to give as much medical coverage to people as possible with a very limited amount of money. And so the model was employed simply because there wasn't money available to, to employ a different type of model. And so that model expanded and improved. And, and, and by the time I became the leader of the union, my predecessor had improved it further. Um, we found a, a, a medical operation that employed close to a thousand people um, that most of us were unhappy with. We were unhappy with the facilities, we were unhappy with the quality of the treatment, and we were unhappy with the general experience, and most of our members were unhappy with it as well. So over the years, I mean, you, you, you built the showcase institution in, in Harlem mm -hmm. uh, in 2003. Mm -hmm. you, you bought a piece of land and one of the things that people don't know about the hotel employees, who gets insurance coverage? Who? Well, let, let me just say that we went to the hotel industry and sat down with them in collaboration and said, look, this is worth fixing. Costs are escalating. This is worth fixing. We can control costs and we can have a quality product if we work together. And to their credit, they saw that and they invested in it. So during my tenure, we've expanded, we've renovated, we've built new centers, we've brought a much stricter sort of business atmosphere into them. Um, we've hired quality chief executive officers and, and executives. We incentivize them the way a corporation would incentivize people. And we try to run the facilities like 
like a well-oiled business machine. Now, but what I was saying before is if a union member, okay, a, a housekeeper, a busboy, uh, a waiter, the member gets p insurance coverage. That's right. Their spouse well, or the domestic partner gets coverage. Their dependent children get coverage. Retirees get coverage for life. And the retiree spouse. And the retirees. So member, dependents, domestic partners, retirees, retiree spouse for life. Right. And we provide all that coverage, and it's the broadest possible coverage. There are no co-pays. The only co-pay. Five dollars for, for, for prescription, prescription drugs. drugs. And but it's dental, it's optical, it's everything. It's all inclusive. That's right. It's all inclusive. And, and so we provide all of that coverage, and believe it or not, we provide it for around 40% cheaper than you could buy that coverage on the open market. And, and the reason for that is because we're self-insured, because we employ or, or have contract relations with doctors and providers, and there's no advertising budget, there's no corporate jets, there's no giant corporate bonuses. The money that we take in is spent on the employee's behalf. And, you're, and, you're, and you're saving the hotel owners money because their premiums are, are lower than the premiums they would pay over there. You have been called probably one of the most influential labor leaders in the country. You're, the head of your union, uh, the national, John Wilhelm, said that what you did a couple of years ago, you negotiated a contract in 2012 that goes to 2019 mm -hmm. for a living wage. Talk to me about that because people aren't aware of of, of what has happened and, and, and your philosophy on this of why there should be a living wage. You know, when, when somebody's cleaning a room for $300, if they're doing two rooms, right? Wasn't that a little discussion? Well, look, first of all, I view my primary goal, my primary objective, my primary responsibility as the leader of the union is to provide long-term stability to the people I represent. And so to the extent that I'm capable to marshal the resources to negotiate a contract that represents economic fairness and to extend that for as many years as possible. To the extent I can do that, I've done my job. And so I've now negotiated three industry-wide contracts uh, since I've taken over as the leader. And this last one is, is a seven-year contract, you're correct. Um, and at the conclusion of this contract, uh, a dishwasher, in a union hotel will be making $30 an hour. And they will have holidays and sick days and personal days and vacation days and full medical and dental and optical and they'll have a dignified pension. And more importantly, or just as important, a contract that has language in it that clearly spells out what their obligations are and what their rights are and a mechanism to enforce those things if, God forbid, we should run into an employer that doesn't want to play by the rules. But I should say that the truth is that we arrived at a seven-year deal in large measure because the industry also saw value in it. Um, they have stability. They have a medical plan that's way cheaper than the rest of, of, of the city. And they're able to provide medical and at the same time provide long-term contracts to their employees. Most unions that are involved in contract negotiations today are consumed by the issue of the cost of medical. And so we were fortunate that that wasn't an overriding concern in our last negotiation. In fact, the industry agreed to pay for the creation of a new state-of-the-art facility in Brooklyn. And so I'm happy to tell you that um, we just purchased a significant parcel of land on Fulton Street, right, uh, five blocks from the Barclays Center, where we will now build a massive state-of-the-art medical facility um, for our population that lives in Brooklyn. Now, also what you did was you, you've given, especially with that case with the, uh, with the housekeeper, you, you've, you've implemented for your employees uh, the panic switch or something like that? Yeah. So... Some people may remember that there was this uh, case where this French diplomat attacked uh, a room attendant in the Sofitel, and it became an international news story because he was such a notable figure. And out of that, um, 
a lot of tension was created around the fact that room attendants who go into rooms to clean up often run into guests that behave in the most inappropriate manner imaginable. I mean, it's just part of the job. People don't realize how often uh, people experience this. And so the industry in this last contract agreed, and they'll be implementing this this July, to provide panic buttons. So it's an electronic device that's on the person's uh, body where they can hit a, a button and alert security, and the device will tell security where they are and just simply because it was activated that they're in trouble. And hopefully someone comes immediately to make sure that everything is okay. When we got together, I asked you about, you know, as you said, um, you know, Ruben, you're the third person, okay? Mm -hmm. Both of them were immigrants. Um, the first one was not really involved with the unions. He was just an organizer himself. Vito was a, was a waiter, a, bu a busboy over there. You've never really, you never worked in a hotel, but everyone, what's, what's the next generation of union leaders for the Hotel Workers Union? Well, in our union, I'm very optimistic that the next generation of leaders in our union are going to be much better at this than I am. Um, there's there's a, a really interesting mix of people that work at the union. There are rank and filers that have come out and work at the union, and then there are a, a whole host of young folks that we've recruited mostly out of really good colleges that have um, an acute social conscience and want to do good work. And so uh, this, this group just mixes together so well and complement each other so well. And so uh, I have to tell you, I'm so pleased with the mix of people we have there and how, how functional oh, And, and when you talk about pleased, you should be pleased that you've been de married to Debbie for how many years? 30. 30 years married to Debbie. And you have two daughters. Tell me about your two daughters. Well, first I, I should say that, yeah, I've been married for 30 years to Debbie, and, you know, Debbie and I are very lucky. We still love each other, and, and she's still my best friend. And I don't know many guys that can say that after 30 years. And uh, our first daughter is Tina. She's 28, and uh, she works for a lobby firm. And um, our second daughter is Nicole, and she's 25, and she's a nurse at Sloan Kettering, and she's presently going for a graduate degree at NYU. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to say I'm happy to have uh, one of probably the leading <laughs> labor leader in the city of New York who has a, a, a feeling and a condition to help his employees. And, you know, um, it's really great to have you here, and thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me, Michael.